Hi, and welcome to The New Property Show. I'm Steve McManaman. So Tony, what's on the show today? Well, Steve, we have Mark on commercial fit-outs. Our panel discusses part two of developers. But first, Belinda on financial freedom through property. Belinda, welcome. Um, Let's be honest, you're a friend. Absolutely. A property expert, charismatic, and you've got a book in your hand. And we've got a lot to talk about. We've got heaps to talk about. Uh, We actually kind of do the same thing, but I would like to hear uh, one thing that I've noticed about you um, is your processes and you're delivering programs and you're helping people. Be really passionate about that. So who better to introduce you? than yourself. So tell us about you. Fabulous. Well, thank you for having me. Um, Our company is called Positive Property and it's run by a gentleman called George Mykoski. And George has been in the market. He's been doing this for nearly 30 years. He works with people like um, Robert Kiyosaki. Robert Kiyosaki actually endorses our program. He's one of George's mentors. And he wrote wrote a book, Freedom Through Property. Mm -hmm. And it was back when he was He was in his 20s, he was trying to work out how to invest in property and actually create passive income. And it was only until his 30s he actually got to a system where he had 10 positive geared investments. And that was making him around $180,000 a year just for getting out of bed. Not too bad. Fantastic. And obviously he created a system and we've been actually educating our members that system one property at a time. And uh, the success has been absolutely fantastic. Do you want to talk to us? Um, I, I'm not sure if you use the word coaches, but you have a number of people that work um, in that business, uh, of course. Correct. Um, and they essentially take on a client, as this is from what I've, what I've gathered, take on a client, we've identified goals and objectives, that sort of stuff, and we take them through one property at a time. But your process is quite methodical. Uh, obviously, Absolutely. you've got the book, um, which is, yeah, I mean, the beginning is the, the first thing is to educate yourself, but you really do need a coach. Absolutely. Um, do you want to talk to me about how your program works yep. and what some of those steps are, even if they don't come on the program, Yes. Um, what are some of the steps that they should take? So, I mean, our major goal is we want to really help everyday Australians create financial freedom through property. Yep. And your first investment is actually not buying property. It's, mm-hmm. it's getting educated and investing mm-hmm. in yourself. So our job is actually as coaches and mentors to guide people, keep them really safe, but educate them as they're actually doing it. We've got a whole circle of safety from mortgage managers, Mm -hmm. insurance companies, property management, a whole community of people that will actually support the members coming through. And obviously our role is we wanna get them the best property, make sure that they can leverage and then we'll be ready for their second one. And I think too, um, one of the things that I've noticed and why I know your brand's so good is that you actually bring together your members. Now that's dangerous, okay, <laughs> because... Look, I can tell you honestly, yeah, there's hundreds yeah. of companies, you probably will never meet another member, whereas yeah. we actually are a community. We, we feel like safety in numbers. We go live every Thursday. Yeah. We love members asking questions. George, the owner of the business, he gets in the trenches with his members and talks about everything they want to know about property and also doing amazing uh, meetups all around Australia. And our workshops once a year as well, which are pretty fun as well. I think too, it's always, look, it's nice to have your coach, but it's nice to know someone you've got once, as you would say, in the trenches with you. And I've done a lot of workshops with DIFNA and the, um, a lot of oh, those knowledge sources correct. and those sort of stuff as well. But I think it is nice to know that you've got a group. Um, I've invited you for dinner a couple of times and you, you've said, look, I've actually got a commitment to my members, which is one hour that I have to give them. And also you check in with your staff. So. What I'm finding, as I said, and it's taken us a while to get you here, and that's because you've been so damn busy. I know, I know. <laughs> um, this market's not slowing down, I can tell you that right now. Let's talk a bit about the book. Yes. Um, let's talk a bit about the man, George. So yep. I, I see personally, see George, love George, met him a few times. Uh, I like that he's approachable. Um, I like that you can go to the top. I understand you guys are coaches, but he does get in and, and mentor some of the students. Absolutely. Um, this, this book here... What are they going to get out of it? And um, I think we're going to give away a few free copies. Yes, yeah, we're going to yeah. give, absolutely. Yeah. So look, the whole idea, when it comes down to doing anything in your life, yeah. you've got to invest in yourself, but you've also got to find mentors with real life results. Yeah. So one thing I, I loved about George, and I joined his program five years ago as a member, 
was the fact that he actually had real life results. Mm -hmm. He started with nothing, no yep. silver spoon. Uh, he knew at an early age, his parents were immigrants. Mm -hmm. He wasn't gonna get a bit in, big inheritance. So the next step was he had to create his own financial freedom and he did it through property. He chose that vehicle, which was obviously, uh, you know, property investing. And, you know, he got to a point where he, was, he did do 10 positive geared investments. And the great thing now is he's in his 50s now. Mm -hmm. He's on to almost just under 50 properties. The guy, knows, the guy knows what he's doing. Yep. He works with so many different people around Australia. He's on Channel 9, Channel 10. He gives, he's now known as the leading advisor when it comes to property in Australia. So whenever there's, um, we've just done the no-go zones in mm -hmm. Australia. So the beautiful thing is you wanna be around someone who's doing it, real life results, but are still active and really understanding and also looking at predictions of where the market's going as well. We'll definitely have to get him to speak at one of our seminars. Absolutely. George, if you're watching, come on board. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, now, how are they going to get a, um, a free book? So, Okay, so do? the great yeah. thing about it, the first investment is actually yeah. getting, get, getting educated. Yeah. This is an amazing book. It's yeah. uh, Amazon bestseller in five countries. Mm -hmm. And um, the best thing we can do is we're going to put a QR code or we can go on your website, I believe. Yeah, so we can go on to YouTube, um, just comment, free book. That's free it. book. Uh, free book. Doesn't um, get easier than that. It's very, very simple. Um, are you guys paying for the postage and handling or what are we doing now? Uh, I'm actually going to send it, I can actually send it as an e-book. Oh, fantastic. Or we can do an audio. So if you like walking around the block and taking the dog for a walk, you can, can we, listen to that. Can we challenge you here? Yes. Can we get uh, 10 copies signed by George? Um, Absolutely. So the e-book, but yes. first 10 people. I think um, first 10 people will give them a signed copy. Actually, yep. I've got a signed copy here now. So absolutely, we'll get 10 copies and um, we'll post them out or meet in person or whatever. Oh, yeah, and I think too, um, one of the things that I did notice about what you guys do with your members is the, is the, the meetups. Yeah, um, the meetups are a lot of fun. I know we've got a lot to cover. We're obviously going to get you back. But do you want to just tell me what happens in a meetup? Um, so yeah. we've got a couple of different ones. We've got our yep. workshops. Our yep. last workshop was in Bali, which yep. was fantastic. We had a lot of members coming over for the two-day event, but then turning it into a holiday for the family, Love which it. was fantastic. And then the second part is we do members meetups around Australia where I'll find an amazing little quirky little pub, yep. invite the members and new members. So what it is is a chance to meet other people that have started on the program and just talk and just be total transparency and authentic being authentic I think that's better than any review because um, I mean look yeah. yeah I mean we've got hundreds <laughs> yeah. of reviews we've yeah. got you know gold star ratings on Google but I think actually meeting people and talking about their stories and how they started I mean we've got some amazing stories where people started with absolutely zero and now they're on their third fourth fifth property so and it's last, amazing last thing for you um, would be this so for somebody that's a little bit young and watching, um, they're, they're going to educate, they're going to get started. Um, can they get you as a coach? Because I definitely have you. <laughs> well, at the or, moment, or our how does that work? correct. Yeah. Uh, our youngest member is 18 going on 19. Yeah. And my oldest member is going, moving into the 70s. So, you know, the whole idea is absolutely they can have us as a coach. Yeah. But what we've got to do is start them on a series of little baby steps, yeah. slowly but surely and getting really educated. So by the time they're ready to buy that property, they've got the full understanding of the structure, the tax, everything that goes involved with getting a property. So they're super, super safe. So it's a done for you model, but it's more like a done with you. It's a do it with you, not do it for you, because at the end of the day, I want our members to really learn the yeah. process, but I also have an ulterior motive. Love it. Once they get their first property, they're easy to coach. <laughs> they are. <laughs> You've been amazing. Thanks for joining us Thank on your you. public show. Love amazing. having you back. Excellent. Thank you so much for having me. Mark, welcome to the new property show. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Different topic today, commercial fit outs. Um, for those that don't know, what is a commercial fit out? How's your business operate? And I'm sure there's a bloody, there's a lot of red, red tape in your industry. Yeah, 100%, uh, really good question. I mean, commercial fit outs have really changed over the last 30 years and the uh, compliance around mm -hmm. that is absolutely massive. You can't design an interior, commercial interior without even thinking about disabled access these days. So you yep. need a DDA consultant, which is a design disability um, uh, consultant to really navigate that field around discrimination against disabled mm -hmm. um, access. And not just for customers in retail uh, environments, but uh, staff, right? So to give an example, a project that I just completed 
uh, which is a medical centre and pharmacy dispensary, not only mm -hmm. were we looking from disabled access uh, on the pharmacy and the medical centre for the uh, customer, but also for the staff. Now, whether they were employing a staff mm -hmm. member that was in a wheelchair or not, is completely irrelevant. So is that, uh, for example, door opening? So traditional door opening used to go down to as narrow as 720. Yep. That's out the door. Yep. Um, pardon the pun. Um, 820, 920. So do you want to talk to us about some of the dimensions and sort of stuff and yep. what um, maybe three major things that have changed? Yeah, well, yep. obviously, number one, your disabled toilets, that, that turning yep. circle and that egress around that. Yep. But one, one that I really found that was really interesting going into a, into a dispensary, a pharmacy mm -hmm. dispensary was you know, where you have the pharmacy dispensary and the normal retail mm -hmm. area where you can have a naturopath serving mm -hmm. and the pharmacy dispensary is a pharmacist and they can't cross mm -hmm. over and you have opening doors on your joineries, mm -hmm. you're designing for the wheelchair access not to clip their hands through that. Oh, okay. So you're not just, yeah. you know, accessing yeah. here, you've got to allow that person that needs to be able to go through those, those doors mm -hmm. uh, and not clip their hands oh. and then have a full turning circle in that dispensary area. All right, so, so it's really important that when you know, people are doing any type of commercial uh, you know, fit out, that the first thing that they're talking about now is uh, disabled access for customers and staff. Uh, and if they don't, uh, they hold themselves liable for discrimination and, and a lawsuit. What about somebody who you know, built a building a couple of years ago, um, it's quite new, um, and then there's a lease takeover. Um, so, so now there's, a, there's an opening? Yep. Um, does that still need to, does someone have to come in and do a fit out then or do they just leave it as it was? It's a, it's a yeah. big question, but if I give you a couple of scenarios, yeah. if you take on something that already has something, it may not be up to the current standards. Yep. Yep. Um, and then some people may not be aware of that and they leave that mm -hmm. and then nobody kind of knows and yep. then the fit out goes on. Cool. Um, if it's a change of use, then it mm -hmm. triggers different changes of use. So in this particular one, we had a medical centre and a retail mm -hmm. uh, pharmacy and triggered a uh, change of use that then brought in a whole lot of realm of changes in the disabled access to, to that interior. So it, it can, a lot of people are, are just mm -hmm. not aware, uh, but the best thing to do is, you know, speak to your head architect, head designer, mm -hmm. even a DDA consultant, mm -hmm. um, and really get some understanding on that. Uh, even if you pay them as a consultant uh, to give you some advice on what are the current regulations within that zoned area. What else does your business do? So. Um so, for example, there's going to be a shop fit out to a warehouse fit out. Do you want to just give us an example of what a, what a fit out is? Are they getting benches? Are they getting power yeah, walls? Yeah, so, they getting? so yeah. you know, one of the jobs that we're looking at the moment in Thornbury is pharmacists want to take over an old NAB building. It's a three-storey yep. building, so mm -hmm. it'll be one-storey uh, yep. ground-level pharmacy and then a Wilder sub two levels. So, you know, yep. we, I go in and do a pre-lease inspection and a feasibility Say study. Wilder's hub. Wellness Hub, yeah. That's fantastic. That's a, I think the medicine and the Wellness Hub definitely yep. need to go together. Yeah, I play a yep. lot in that space. So, yep. yeah, so the so a lot of people are now looking to go to a Wellness Hub, mm -hmm. uh, and this particular one, uh, you know, if it, if the job goes ahead, mm -hmm. uh, it's great. But at the end of the day, my job is to go in and before they sign the lease and do a pre-lease inspection to save them money, and to give them an understanding of the guidelines and bring in any expert consultants that may need to come in and go, okay, you know, on this particular one, I said to them, well, the, the building is not to current standards, an old NAB building mm -hmm. built in the, in the late 70s. Uh, I said, the first thing that I see is a problem. If you take the pharmacy downstairs and then you want to have, you know, level one and then the mezzanine level mm -hmm. uh, as uh, a wellness hub, then you're going to have to, or the landlord's going to have to put in an elevator to get mm -hmm. disabled access. Yeah. And that means you're going to have to punch a hole in the slab to get that through there's 200 grand right there. Are you aware of that? Because if you take the lease on with yep. not knowing that in the commercial world, buyer beware because you take that on. You take that on, then you've either got to pay that 200 grand because you haven't negotiated with your landlord or you can't open upstairs. So all of a sudden you've got these pharmacists like, holy moly, I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. And that's where getting someone like myself or an expert mm -hmm. in pre-leasing and feasibility study on whether it's a single story commercial fit out, um, you know, whether it's a you know, double, three level, Are it doesn't matter. paying for that advice because obviously what you've just given away there yep. um, is valuable. You've just saved someone 200 grand. Oh yeah, 100%. Really just then. Yep. Um, and obviously you still want to quote for your business. Yep. But can they employ you um, more just as a consultant to begin with and then, then quote on the work later? Because yep. you, 
you could go and give that advice and say, hey, we yep. want to do an elevator. Yep. They don't do business with you. They go find the cheapest elevator person out there for a hundred grand. Well, they, well, they can't yep. because they need commercial yep. builder's license. Yep. Uh, and they need uh, a head interior designer or mm -hmm. architect to put their yep. license number on the building permit. So you're positioning yourself in a way that you're sort of the main go-to. Correct. So, yep. so as a commercial builder, yep. commercial fit-out builder, mm -hmm. uh, I have a license under the Victorian Building Authority mm -hmm. to do commercial building, but I have an interior design license, which is like a head architect contractor yep. license, mm -hmm. to then engage all the architects, interior designers, you know, uh, DDA consultants, building surveyor, mm -hmm. structural engineer, mechanical engineer, fire services, acoustic engineers, depending what it might be. What about if we just kept it simple? Um, I just want to build a... I don't know, uh, nutrition warehouse. I want to build something that's just going to include some shelving and yep. some cash registers yep. uh, and managerial office out the back and that sort of stuff yeah. as well. So again, if, it, if it, yeah, 100%. Yeah. If it's in a shopping centre, you yeah. know, generally in a Westford or Lend Lease, yeah. that's an easy thing. Yeah. But if it's uh, in an existing street shop, you have to think about is the site heritage listed? Yeah. Are you going to remove the, the shop front on the last fit out we yeah. did in Carnegie? We had asbestos in there. Uh, we put in a vault for, for the medicinal cannabis mm -hmm. um, products that they sell there and under when we had to cut the concrete out because the vault was too heavy for the concrete, mm -hmm. we then had water problems and then we had to go down deeper in that concrete. How heavy was that vault? Uh, it was 10.5 10 tonne and yeah. uh, I mean it was inherited when I did the project yeah. and uh, nobody thought to think about well is that is that slab going to go through the the, is that safe going to go through the, the slab? Yeah. And because I'd done a lot of jewellery shops back in the day in yeah. Westfield centres, one of the first things that you learn when you're doing a, a jewellery shop, yeah. if you're going to put a safe on the first floor, yeah. if that safe falls through that concrete slab, yeah. it's going to kill somebody. Yeah, of course. So same here, I said to, the, to, to my customer, I said, you know, I'm he inheriting this safe, but like how much does it weigh? It was 10.5 yeah. tonne was a 110 year old heritage listed building. So the, wow. the odds were, yeah. so we uh, did a drill a core hole into the slab, got a soil test, and mm -hmm. all of a sudden we realized that it's gonna go straight through. And that's structural fit out works. So, yeah. you know, that's, that's what I do. You know, we don't do decorations. We do commercial yeah. structural fit out works. So you rip so out a shop. playing with the big boys. Yeah, playing with the big boys. Yeah. Uh, you know, on this project, we had to rip out the shop front. Yep. All the glazing that was in there was to the Australian standards, but they're all obsolete. So it was all had to come out because it was obsolete because the standards had changed over the last 35 years. We'd love to um, obviously have you back on the show as well and talk about some of the newer projects because I understand you're starting some newer projects at the moment, yep. tendering and you're winning some jobs, which is fantastic. Um, it would be good to visualise some of the, the stuff that you're coming out as well. So yep. would you mind coming back on the show oh, 100%, again and sharing yeah, some of your yeah, yeah. expertise? And, Love to educate your customers. Um, yep. We'll bring some cameras out to site and yep. see what you do. 100%. I uh, want to thank you for being a great guest and thank thanks you. for coming on your first appearance on great. the new property show. Thanks very much for having me. At the end of the day, John's got a vision of five to ten years, okay? Yep. Um, he's just bought a, a block of land, a PS, non PSP approved. Yep. You're the acting client, uh, yep. you're, you're, you're servicing that sort of stuff. Uh, he might be in a good position now, but you, yep. you've got to maintain that relationship with John and also the land passes he's selling over the next eight years. Mm -hmm. How often do you guys need to speak and how would you support um, that PSP approval and also servicing and also selling off those land parcels? So in this case, you'd actually need to be friends with the developer, the yeah. business there. How would that relationship be? I think used? as a conveyance, we never want to pee off the developer because yeah. at the end of the day, the developer is one that's determining the settlement taking place. Yeah. Um, as a conveyance, I guess we have uh, one mixed feeling on what the client's feeling within the developer yep. and how the developer actually feels from a legality perspective and, and what they're developing. So if I talk more on a clientele perspective, what we as a conveyancing industry, what we actually struggle with is, and this will also fall into the conveyancing legislation as well, is with developments, for example, we're talking about planner subdivisions. So our clients are buying a land that's two years yet to subdivide by that time. Developers are quite strict on the timeframes for our clients. So a developer can take, you know, their sunset clauses can range between two to five years and it can take that time to register, but then they expect the clients to settle within two weeks. Yeah. It's not relevant enough time for a client. Not even the developer knows when it's actually going to be finalized. No one actually knows. So when we come across from a clientele perspective, they have, you know, they're requesting extensions. Developers are not willing to extend that penalty free. Um, they are quite tough on the clientele. Then we move on to the actual development perspective, which is where John, you would come in, and, and you know, you know, as as though you're doing these subdivisional lands. Developing is a lot of work, 
and not even the developers themselves will know what time frames you know it could be weather conditions it could be the reports coming through there are so many delays in developments and so many different sectors within a development that actually comes to the finish line so while developers are quite strict on the clientele as well they're also got a lot of money behind them not only do they want to get paid but they probably owe money as well um, to those type of people as well so from a developing perspective, we can understand the, the, what they do for mm -hmm. the clientele, um, but the, client, the developer also needs to resell those lots. They've probably got a time mm -hmm. frame, or if they're fund, getting it funded, they've got a time frame on where to ha they have to pay back that money towards. So within conveyancing, we face both sides, and I guess the conveyancing is to educate the clientele on how a development actually works and why the developer is the way they are with being so strict on the settlement time frames. I think the big thing too that John touched on earlier, but they're, they're first in, last out. Mm. Um, but probably um, back to you, John, with this one here, sunset clauses, okay? Um, and the guy, I obviously know who you are, and I think you'd be quite reasonable if, if that conversation, because it's, it's very, very easy to assume there's a thousand deals sitting there, but you get to know your client. But you're approaching uh, 23 months of a sunset clause. We know there's going to be exited at 24. Do you intentionally hold the project up and then resell the lots, or? Do you try and honour that and do that? Because it, there's a, sometimes a cash grab there. I've seen that uh, with some of my clients in WA at the moment. Land's gone up, they've purchased 190 grand. They've missed the settlement by mm. 14 days. And that wasn't their fault because the settlement got delayed, this got delayed, then they got two weeks and then suddenly they just went rescission, ripped it up. Yep. And the client mm. was probably three <coughs> days off settling. Mm. Um, how do you so think the laws so need I, to change I've there heard some horror bit? stories yeah. about that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think everyone has. I think we've yeah. all heard them. Yeah. 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 That's, that's a land issue as opposed yeah. to an apartment issue. Yeah. Like yeah. I, I don't know of any apartments where the developer has relied on the sunset clause to, yeah. to make a gain. Yeah. Like when you're talking about apartments, um, you're in for usually hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars yeah. mm -hmm. and you have finances so every, there. Every mm -hmm. sale Correct. counts. So yep. every sale counts. So I think yep. when it comes to a conveyance of point of view, um, from an apartment developer, and certainly from our perspective, mm -hmm. um, we sell to settle. Like yep. the, the only money is made with settlement. So we we look at we look at a number of things uh, along that journey. One is communication. I think is critically important. So mm -hmm. making sure that that purchaser knows well out when title when the when the block is going to be titled. You're right. There are variations. Mm -hmm. You know, you might apply for council, and they might take a couple of weeks to get it, or you might have delays with trades. But typically. As a developer, if you're an experienced developer, you should pretty much know. Uh, certainly three months out, 100%. you should have a pretty good guide. Mm. Um, where we see challenges is where purchasers might change their email address. You know, they buy a lot, mm. something happens mm. in their life and their changes, and changes occur. So they change their address, they change their email address, they change their phone number, and they don't update the developer. Mm. Mm. So we're there trying to get in touch with this person mm. who has, for That's all intents fine. and purposes, yep. vanished. Um, the emails that we send them every single month might go to spam or they might have mm -hmm. blocked them, they might unsubscribe to a marketing email and suddenly that affects their purchaser updates. So any of these things might limit the, the communication they get. We understand that so we get on the phone and we call all of them. Providing they've given us the right phone number, we get through. But I also think that to be, to be fair, it also plays on the client if you've purchased something and you've even if you've ordered food you're going to do a check-in mm. <laughs> yeah. I think there needs to be especially when you're more, doing that money there needs to be a hundred percent and this is where you need that, that middle person which is effectively mm. the conveyance would come in mm. is to develop because we're all in the art of selling I guess mm. uh, and settling um, but the relationships there so I think to be honest I actually think developers are copying a tough rap because they're, they're the front of the business Absolutely. but behind a, a good developer is 50 to 200 jobs because there's the infrastructure included Absolutely. actually funding the backbone of Australia at the moment. Mm. Um, I heard from the treasurer from Sydney the other day that we simply don't have enough land um, and we have more people moving in and the other thing that's changed is there's more um, the, in terms of that there's 2.5 people per household but we'd, there really needs to be more. <laughs> Um, because we, d we don't have enough um, properties at the moment. So I think at the moment... Well, there could be seven. Yeah. Mm. Or nine. <laughs> or nine. Um, yeah. <laughs> we did offer nine. It, it, it is. It yeah. is about producing the right product for yeah. the future of this country. And I yeah. think we have a very, very kind of distorted view of what the world of property is. It only, you know, we, we do a lot of 
journeys to New York City and Tokyo mm -hmm. and places where you wouldn't dream of having the type of properties we have here. Mm -hmm. and, and they still have a place, um, but as the world moves and as we get more dense and where cities get bigger, mm -hmm. it's important to develop the right stock. And that's why mm -hmm. things like you know, apartments, which used to be a big taboo world, no one will want to kind of touch it in the property world, uh, are now back back into the conversation table. That's why some of the stuff we do, which will be massively stigmatized 10, 20, 30 years ago, is now trendy again, and it's kind of creating a revival of what they, what they ultimately these communities need, need to be. Well, I think too with what you're doing, and this is in the co-living space, we can just touch on it for a second, um, and depending on your laws in the States, but mm -hmm. um, I myself, I work with um, typically five to eight. Yep. Um, I know you might deal with the nines. Yep. Um, the only reason I don't go to nines is the lending um, sometimes changes with the with the building. Yep. Um, so the, the ability to get the funding and also mm -hmm. I don't like going past a million dollars to deal with my clients. Mm -hmm. Your projects are in a million. But what people are looking for and they get out of a co-living versus an apartment is they're getting nine micro <laughs> Um, friendships that yes. they most of the time. Absolutely. The other thing too that changes is it actually goes in the favour when you do a co-living, it actually goes to the advantage of the landlord. Uh, mm -hmm. The Tenancy Act changes. Yeah. So um, if somebody's misbehaving, not paying their rent or doing something wrong, Correct. you actually can kick those people out within 24 hours. So um, it actually gives you more confidence to build your style of product. I, I think how developments viewed and change will change. Okay, so most people at the moment are looking for services. Yes, they're looking for um, childcare services because a lot of work from home, office space, work from home. Um, I think health and wellness is something that's super important. I think mental mental health is something that needs to be covered. So there needs to be the libraries, the pools, the gyms, um, and those facilities. Mm. And they're also looking for a little bit more luxury. <laughs> mm. They, I, I'm feeling the world's getting smaller. I think that mm. they they want all those facilities at their fingertips. But I do feel that development's going to change. I think the yep. word mm. development is now changing to um, compact living <laughs> mm. uh, with with, lux with luxury lifestyle and providing you're doing that. I think that's about all we've got time for. But as I said, um, put your hand up if you're in favour of developers. Yeah, absolutely. There we, we go. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> Keep your hand up if you do business with John. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> no one. <laughs> right. Guys, um, great debate. Thank you for joining us on your property show. And at the end of the day, I, I think it's always check the financials, uh, make sure they've got experience, and do business with people that you trust. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. That's all for this week, and thank you for joining us. If you want to see the full interviews, check out our website, thenewpropertyshow.tv, and we'll see you again next week.